So thank you for inviting me here today. My name is Margaret Hirsch. I'm the Chief Operations Officer of Hirsch's Home Store. For those of you who don't know, it's the biggest independent appliance, electronic, furniture and bedding company in South Africa. It's still a completely family-owned business. And we started it from nothing. My husband and I started it when we had absolutely nothing. And the reason that I come to talk to people is to prove to them that you don't have to have anything to start. You don't have to come from anywhere to start. It's not where you come from that makes a difference. It's where you decide you're going to. <laughs> And what makes Hirsch's different is that we're, not, we're just not there for the profit. What we, our aim is, is to grow the people who work with us and to grow as many people as we can to become as wealthy as they possibly can. Because I've been poor and I've been wealthy and it's much better being wealthy, no matter what people tell you. So... <laughs> So uh, just to give you an idea of our business, this year, at the end of our financial year, we'll turn over 2 billion rand, which means I make between 150 and 200 million rand a month. Now, I tell you not that, that, I don't tell you that to impress you, but to impress upon you that if I can do it, you can do it. And every one of you can do it. Because when God made you, he put the seed of greatness inside you. He hid it. He could have hidden it on the top of a mountain or down a river or under the sea, but you would have found it there. So where did he hide it? He hid it where you, he thought you'd never find it. And he hid it right inside of you. And it's there. And with that seed of greatness, he put a gift. He gave every one of you a gift. And a lot of people go to their grave without finding their gift. But I was so fortunate I found my gift. That when I look at anybody, as when I look at each one of you, I look at you not as you are, but as you can be. And I want to ask you a question. Could you be better than you are? And the answer is, of course you could. You could be so much better than you are. But what's holding you back? Only yourself. That's the only thing that's holding you back. So I'll just go back in my life journey. It started as far as I can remember when I was 10 years old. My father died. My mother had been a, a very spoiled, adopted only child. She'd had the most wonderful life. She married the boy next door. They went off together. They made a beautiful home. They had a beautiful home. They had a son and a daughter. And everything would have been perfect. In the movies, it would have been the most perfect happily ever after. But one day, when I was 10 years old, he came home with a brain hemorrhage, and he died overnight like that. And my mother was taken from a very comfortable environment to an environment where she had no skills. She had no way of coping in the world. So she was very quickly swindled out of the little bit of money that she had, and she didn't know what to do. And she was left not only in the world on her own, because by this time her parents had died, but she had two children to look after as well. So she took me and put me into a foster home in Loop Street, Peter Marisburg, and took my little brother down to Durban and went to look for a job. And she found one at Ninian and Leicester in Durban for 30 rand a month. And that's what we had to live on. And she scraped and scrambled and got herself together. And about six months later, she took me out of school in Peter Marisburg, took me down to Durban, and we lived in the back room of a relative's house, very, very poor. And it, everything, we were scratching along. And 18 months later, she married my stepfather, which would have been fine, as he was earning 50 rand a month. But he came with three teenage children, and we were then about two teenage children. So we were five teenage children, two adults. And she did the only thing she knew to do. She became a homemaker, so she gave up work. So all seven of us were living on 50 rand a month. So life was not easy. We really had a struggle and a battle. And I had to battle and struggle for everything that I had in my life. But I knew that I was born for greatness. I knew that things would turn around. And I knew that I could turn it around. And the only one who was going to do it was me. So I went and I straggled along. And I went to work straight off to school. I finished school on the Friday, started work on the Monday. And I worked my way around. And when I was um, 20, I met my husband. We were other side of a room, I saw him over there and I saw him straight away. You've all seen that thing where the chameleon sees the fly and goes, <laughs> well, that's what happened when I saw my husband. He didn't know what hit him and I think 44 years later, he's still reeling from the shock. But uh, I just saw him and I knew he was the one for me and um, I wanted to marry him. Everybody said, but why do you want to marry him? First of all, he's Jewish. I didn't even know what that was. I said, he's a Jew. I said, well, Jesus was a Jew, and he was quite nice. You know, it must be okay. So, um, and I had no idea about religion and all that type of thing. I thought everybody was the same as me. But we went along, and then I also discovered that although he was 24 years old, he could not read or write. He'd gone through the whole of his school life, never been able to read or write. And when he failed Standard 7 for the third time when he was 18, his father said to him, look, you're never going to get your matric. So you may as well get a job where you work with your hands because, you know, what else can you do? So he went and he got a job and he worked with his hands. He was a refrigeration technician. And he was working for a boss at that time and uh, fixing fridges and the boss was selling fridges. And at that same time, I was working, I was a shorthand typist and I was working 
away. And when we'd been married for five years, and I went and told my boss I was pregnant, he said two words, and it was not congratulations, Margaret. He said, you're fired. And it was in the days before the CCMA and all that type of thing, so I had no object, op option, but I had to take my handbag, go home. And I made a vow that day. I said, I will never work for anybody else in my life again, and I never have. So he did me the biggest favor that anybody could have ever done me. And I went home and I thought, what did God give me? He gave me my brains and my two hands, and that's all I need. From this, I can do anything. So I phoned all the people I knew, and I said, if you've got typing to do, bring it to me. I'll type it in the morning. You can fetch it in the night. And then I phoned other people I knew. I said, bring your typing in the night. I'll type it, and you can fetch it in the morning. And that's how I started my little business from home. And at the same time, 1976, 77, 78 in South Africa, Ellen J. Hellman started Game, Dion Friedlander started Dion's, T uh, Tony Factor was big in Joburg. Everybody was discounting. So my husband said to his boss, you know, you do the selling. Why don't you try discounting these appliances? And his boss said, if you're so blooming clever, you go and do it. So that's how we went from having two children, for no jobs. Uh, sorry, that's how we went from having two jobs and no children to having two children and no jobs in the space of one year. And it was a baptism of fire because we had no family to fall back on, we had no income to fall back on, and we had to make a go of it. So we started our little business in a room as big as your toilet with a capital of 900 rand, which lasted exactly five minutes because we had to pay um, 300 rand rent, 300 rand for our license, and 300 rand for the sign outside, and that was all gone. And we started from day one. Our first day's taking was 11 cents. But it was 11 cents more than we had the day before. So we thought if we could do that every day and double it, so it would go. And that's actually what we did. We just did a little bit every single day. And life went on, and we started to build up our business, and it started to build up. And we would see other people who started businesses the same time as us. This one chap, Billy Healy, he just went past, and he was in a new car. And the next week, he had a boat behind the car. And we were still working, and he was going off for a weekend, and his wife and kids were waving at us, saying, we're going away for the weekend, and we were still working. And we thought, what are we doing wrong? But what he did is what most people do when they start a new business. They equate turnover as profit. And they spent the money, and when they had to pay it back, it was all gone. So we started our little business, and we started, went from little bit to little bit, but we put it away, and we invested back into the business, and we made it stronger and stronger. And that's how our business started. I have to fast forward now, and fast forward a few years, and it started to build up really nicely. And by 1988, we started in 1979, by 1988, we had two million rand in the bank. And for us, that was a fortune. We were really, it was amazing. And everybody said to us, now you've got to expand your business. And we thought, how do we do that? They said, you need a good middle management. And we didn't have one. So we went out, we thought we could buy it. So we found a company who was very similar to ours, was an old father, and he had three sons, and he was selling the business. And when we said to him, how much do you want? He said, two million rand. We said, this must be meant to be, because that's what we had. And so we went and we checked it all out and everything seemed fine. And on the afternoon that I signed and gave him my two million rand, he had shown that he'd paid all his creditors. Well, he had, but he'd kept all the checks back. And as I signed and gave him my money, he released three million rands worth of checks. So I went from having two million rand in the bank to a three million rand overdraft in one afternoon. Now, what most people would have done in a case like that, thinking now it's taken me nearly 10 years to make that money, and it not only has it gone, but more than double has gone down the toilet, you would have given up. But we had no way to give up because there was no one to give up to. We couldn't fall backwards. There was no one to fall back on. So we had to just keep on going. So we just kept on going, and we worked harder, and we worked, had more passion in our jobs, and we focused more on what we were doing. And in a short space of time, we made that money back up again. It's just amazing. Once you've done it once, you can do it again. We made the money back up again, and so our business started to flourish and grow. Now, I've got to fast forward a bit more as well. And um, the time had come now, my son was 25, and he didn't find a wife. And for those of you who've got sons, it's a very upsetting thing when you get, your son gets to 25 and hasn't found a wife. You don't want to be left with him when he's 50. <laughs> so I said to my best friend, I don't know what I should do. She said, well, Margaret, I can only tell you this because I'm your best friend. He's never going to find a wife because you're too pushy a mother. So I went straight home. I said to my husband, we're going to live in Johannesburg. We're going to live in Joburg. I would have lived in Durban all my life. He said, why is that? He said, why? I said, because Richard can't find a wife. 
He said, well, why didn't you send him to Joburg? I said, no, I don't know those Joburg girls. I know everybody in Durban. I'm going to leave him here to find his wife. We're going to Joburg. So we came to Joburg, and when I was 50 years old, I'd never set foot in the town in my life. I passed through the airport, and I'd been to one function at Santon City. That was my knowledge of Joburg. So we went and we researched, and we found a little plot of land next to an ostrich farm. My neighbor was a 1,000 ostriches. And we bought the plot of land, and we built a shop. And everybody said, where are you going to live? And I said, I don't know. But I was with the builder, and I said to the builder, can you throw a slab in the shop? He said, yes, I can. I said, can you put three showers and toilets there? He said, yes. And I said, a sink over there? He said, yes. I said to my husband, we're going to live above the shop. So we built our shop in four ways, and we lived above the shop. And we could come down every morning. We weren't bothered with the traffic. And we started our shop like that. And off it grew. And it did exceptionally well in a short space of time. Because we gave customers what they hadn't had in, in Joburg before, which was excellent customer service. We looked after them. We treated everybody as if they were our best friend. And we looked after them. And our business grew. And it grew. So we needed another shop. And if people said, did you research and everything? I said, no. What we did, we took a drive on Sunday afternoon. And we got to this place that was called Strubens Valley. I never heard of it, so I googled it. Strubens Valley, the first place in South Africa they found gold. I said to Alan, this sounds good. He said, it does. They found gold, maybe we will too. <laughs> and we started our branch in Strubens Valley, and it went from strength to strength. Then we went to Centurion, and then we went we, all over Joburg. Now we, you know, we met at El Boxburg, everywhere. And our branches started to do well, because we gave customers the best service, but we also looked after our staff exceptionally well. I just want to backtrack a bit. In 1994, when we didn't know what was going to happen, remember 1994, we didn't know what was going to happen in this country, and we had really, really good people working with us. And I said to my husband, I'm just worried that, you know, these people are so good, they're working for us, we don't know what's going to happen in this country. What I think I'm going to do is I'm going to start all of them in their own businesses. So I took all our drivers who do our deliveries of their appliances, and we sold them our trucks really cheap, and we let them pay it off over a period of time, and we said to them, we're going to start you in your own business. And I taught the wife QuickBooks, okay? Always teach the wife how to handle the money. <laughs> and then uh, what I did is I took all our um, technicians who had their little buckies that come fix your fridges and stoves, and I set them up in their own businesses. And then we took all our installers. We've got DSTV installers, air conditioning installers, um, electricians, plumbers, all those type of things that you need for your appliances. And we set them all up in their businesses. And I'm very happy to tell you that 20 years on, they're all still going strong. Okay. So we set them up in their businesses, and off they went. And we looked after them, and they worked under our umbrella, but we made sure that they had a good living, that they could live. And, and we looked after them, and they looked after us. So it was a happy situation. And then um, our business was going really, really well. And in 2011, they said to me, you know, Margaret, we're going to enter you for South Africa's most influential woman in business. And I said, for goodness sake, I'm a toaster sales lady. You know, I, I do, yes, I have a business, but it's not that fantastic. They said, we think it is. They entered me, and I won. I was so surprised. I wasn't even there to take the prize because I never thought I had a chance. So I was, in 2012, I won Businesswoman of South Africa, Entrepreneur Division. And the ladies I was up against, the one lady, her sister was hosting Jacob Zuma at the table. The other lady was on the board of APSA and on nine other boards. And I was a toaster sales lady. I didn't think I stood a snowball's chance. But guess what? I won. I was the most surprised person of all. So I said, what can I do to use this accolade and to use this year to be the best I can be? So what I did is I had all my life been setting up entrepreneurs. In fact, my first entrepreneur was my, my own personal domestic worker at home, because she was wonderful. I trained her so well, and everybody said, oh, your Florence is just so fantastic. I wish I had a Florence at home. So I said to Florence, when you go home at Christmas, just find somebody who wants a job and bring them back with you. So she did. She brought Esther back, and Esther worked in her house, and we trained Esther. And when Esther was trained, we found her a job. But Florence was very clever. She said, what's in it for me? So I said, well, ask Esther to give you 10% of her salary. So whatever she's going to ask, Add 10%, and that's for you. She did that. And so what happened next year when she went home, you guess. She brought somebody else back. We trained her, and she paid her 10% of her salary. And when Florence retired after 30 years, she was getting a whole lot extra of the 10% coming in. So she did really well. And uh, in my store in Amlazi, a lady came and approached me. Her name was Marianne Wundler. And she had been Nelson Mandela's cook when he was in his heyday. 
and she'd retired now. And she says, Margaret, I just love cooking. I love teaching cooking. So I said, you know what? We're in Amlazi. Um, my Amlazi store was right. And those of you who don't know Amlazi, three and a half million people live in this town. And there's only one road out. I said, why don't we teach the people who have no education? Everybody's te- you know, looking after people with an education. There's a lot of people with no education. Let's take them and we're going to teach them to cook because all women can cook. So we'll teach them to cook, and we'll teach them how to make money. So we took women with no education, we brought them into a cookery school, and we taught them how to cook. And they would then get up 3 o'clock in the morning, cook the fed cook and the muffins, and go and sell it on the side of the road from 5 o'clock to the men going to work. By 7 o'clock, they were sold out, and they'd go home and prepare for the next day. But it was so wonderful because they could not only do that, but they could look after their children and other people's children they would take in. And there was always food in the house from you know, the things they were cooking and things that were left over, that type of thing. So it really went well. So Marianne started her kitchen, and I'm very happy to tell you that last year we had 800 graduates out of our school, and everyone has got a job. You see, there's no such thing as unemployment. There are only people who won't work because they think that somebody else has to employ them. If nobody will employ you, employ yourself. I had to do that. I could never work for a boss. I was too cheeky and I used to get into trouble all the time anyway. So I'm very much happier working for myself. I always tell everybody, you can work for a boss and make a living, or you can work for yourself and make a fortune. The choice is yours. So we started the cookery school and we've got a lot, and there were, you know, one of my ladies specializes in African funerals. And those of you who don't know, when an African person dies, the people come from far and wide and it culminates in the funeral usually on a Saturday. And the bereaved family doesn't want to cook. So my lady who I taught to cook would come in and she would do all the cooking for the family in that time. And then they also have praise singers, which I didn't even know existed. They had praise singers. And the praise singers would come and sing the praises of of the deceased person. So we just needed some. So we took some little boys off the street and we taught them how to sing. Marianne's got a lovely voice and she taught them how to sing and what to say about the person. And I'm very happy to tell you that as I stand now, our praise singers have been offered a a turn to go to America and sing there. So it just goes to show the peripherals. You just never know what's going to happen. So we started up a cookery school, and that was going very well. But I started working with young entrepreneurs because I found sometimes they just needed a bit of guidance. They just needed that leg up to get going. So at Hirsch's, what we did is we started our women in business competition where we go into all the areas and we get women nominated because women usually don't like to nominate themselves. We get women nominated, and then we have a winner every month in all the different areas and it culminates at the end of the year with a massive prize and a lovely party and everything. So we feel that we're giving those women just a leg up. Because sometimes your business is going along, but you just want to take it to the next level and you're not quite sure how to. You come to us and we do it for you and we help you along. So we've got a multitude of things going for us. And then uh, one of the things when I won uh, 2012, I just wanted to do something different in the world. And I looked and I searched. And then I went to a talk, and I could not believe what I was hearing, because I was over 60 years old at this stage. And I heard that there's 9 million schoolgirls in South Africa, of which only 40% go to school for four weeks of the month. The other 60% can only go for three weeks of the month, because they've got no sanitary protection. And I was horrified that in this day and age, that a girl would not, she said, your girls would tell me, our family hasn't got money for food. They're not going to buy me sanitary pads. I just have to stay at home. I can't go. And girls, when we went into the schools, would say, I'm the most clever girl in the class, but if it it comes to write the test and I've got my period, I have to stay at home, I can't write the test. So we found that in this country, what was happening is that girls were getting between 40 and 60% aggregate, whereas boys were getting between 60 and 80% aggregate. So what was happening? What message was being sent to the girls? They were being, they thought they were more stupid than the boys, which you all know is not true. So what we did is with our friends Sue Barnes and Durban, we started manufacturing reusable sanitary pads, and we take them to the girls. They're special fabric. They last for five years. It's 100% biodegradable. They're plastic lined so they don't leak. And we take them into the schools, and we've monitored the girls, and within six months, their marks have gone up by at least 20%, and within a year, We've had some that their marks have doubled. So it just goes to show something simple like that, which nobody wants to speak about, can make a huge, huge difference. So my topic was, how can you make a difference in the world? What are you going to do? You know, Mother Teresa said, if we each sweep our own doorstep, the whole world will be clean. And I'm really hoping that you will understand that there's a seed of greatness inside of you. You've got to find it. And if you do, you can go out and you can make a difference in the world. And just in closing, I want to say that I believe that South Africa, I know because I've lived 
overseas. I've lived in England, I've lived in America and Australia. And I can tell you that I've come back to this country because it's the best country in the world. We're in the land of wealth and abundance. This is a land of hope and opportunity. And I want to tell you that in this country, you can make your fortune. And I hope today is the day you'll go out and start. Thank you.